All right, pray without ceasing. We're going to take a look at prayer since Yom Kippur is all about praying and repenting, interceding. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, we're told, Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Messiah Yeshua concerning you. So thanksgiving is a form of prayer that we can practice even in the midst of the battle, even in the midst of the fire, when things aren't going good, even in the midst of Yom Kippur, when our flesh is screaming out for food. So we can pray at all times without ceasing in every situation, knowing that our prayers are going to be effective. Yahweh said that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Now, we should be constantly aware of his presence, constantly in a state of prayer, because he is here with us. Not only is he here with us, we are actually seated with him in heavenly places. In Messiah Yeshua, we are fused together with the Creator. Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. People are not the problem might look like it sometimes but know that there is something behind them driving them to be the way they are for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand and I'm going to skip to the last part of the armor Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Not just the ones we like, all the saints. So what's interesting is as we pray for people that we don't necessarily like, it has a way of changing our feelings towards them too. So the Father knew what he was doing. We're to cover each other with prayer constantly. And especially the ones we don't like, because those are the ones we really need to be praying for. 1 John 5, 16, it says, If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. So we know from the Torah, if the sin carries the death penalty, it's a sin unto death. If it does not, then it is a sin not unto death. And the blood of Yeshua will cover that if we pray for those people. And so our job is to speak life into the situation, not to go try to correct them necessarily, unless he gives us something to say, and we can do it in a humble, godly way that's going to draw them back in. But primarily, we're to pray so that he can intervene in the situation. It gives him a legal right to do so, and uh, he can bring life into the situation. James 5.13 gives us another aspect of prayer. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. So that's the primary thing as we grow in maturity. If we're suffering, we need to pray. But less mature believers, there's another way for them to, to help as well. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the assembly and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, this is not talking about you have to do this that you can be healed supernaturally. He's talking more about relational healings. He wants healing to take place between brothers. He wants us to be one. So as we confess our faults to one another, brother, I sinned against you. I, I said this about you, and I am sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I mean, as we do that and we know that, that we've caused hurt, we're told to leave our our offering on the altar and go be reconciled first and then come back and present your offering. So the Father is very, very concerned about us being one, being in unity. So we confess our trespasses to one another, not necessarily to the whole congregation, but to that one that you've went and wrong. That's the one we're supposed to confess it to. And then pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So again, praying for each other has to do with forgiveness of sin and healing because if we don't forgive he won't forgive us that's one thing that he says in many many places and if we're holding bitterness and unforgiveness it has a way of hindering our own prayers when it comes to praying for for healing ourselves so now here's some scriptural prayers that we can pray for one another the one at the end of Ephesians 1 and the one at the end of Ephesians 3 are really powerful Starting at verse 15, he says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Yeshua and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mentions of you in my prayers. 
that the God of our Lord Yeshua Messiah, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, the ones that are in faith, that power can flow through us then, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Messiah when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the assembly, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. And then the end of Ephesians 3, verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Yeshua Messiah, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith, now, this is a believers he's praying for. So in order for Messiah to continue to dwell in our hearts, it has to be by faith. We have to stay plugged into him in faith so that he'll stay plugged into us. That you, being rooted and grounded in love. See, he shed his love abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, but for us to be rooted and grounded in that love, we have to put it on. We have to practice it. We have to walk in it. You may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth and the height, to know the love of Messiah which passes knowledge. See, there's only three dimensions in this physical realm. He just mentioned four there, so that obviously goes past what our normal dimension and normal eyes can see, but he wants us to understand it. To know the love of Messiah which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, and that's according to our faith, because all the power's in us, but the power that works in us is what we allow to come through and affect others. To him be glory in the assembly by Messiah Yeshua to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So we are to pray for those in authority and to come to salvation, that they come to a salvation in the knowledge of the truth, just like we did. In first Timothy. 2.1, this is where we get our instructions. He says, I exhort you, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So he's not willing that any should perish. We should be praying for the whole world. Yeshua came and died for the whole world. So we need to be praying for them in our prayer life that God leads us to those that are open to receive his, his scriptures, his gospel, and then go out and do it. So this proves that believers are to be involved in politics. If we're supposed to be praying for kings and all those that, that are... There's some believers that have tried to say that, no, we're supposed to be separate from the world and all this other stuff. Well, that, that's not true. He wants us to affect this realm and take it for the kingdom of God. He wants us to be active in every area to do that. Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, because right now they're not for the majority. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They're very zealous in their religion, but unfortunately it's not the right God. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going to about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Messiah, this is where the righteousness comes from, is the end or the goal of the law. For righteousness to everyone that believes. You can't do it just by keeping Torah. Now it's not saying that keeping Torah is wrong because we should keep Torah. It's all about loving the Father. But you can't earn your salvation by doing it. You can't be righteous only by keeping the law. You have to be born again. For Moses describes the righteousness, which is of the law, that the man which does those things shall live by them. That's what the King James says, and that's not a very good translation. In the uh, Peshitta, the Marduk translation of the Aramaic Peshitta in Romans 10.4, it says, For Messiah is the aim of the law, for righteousness, unto everyone that believes. And then the New Jerusalem Bible in Romans 10.5 translates the tenses a little bit better. Moses writes of the saving justice that comes by the law and says that whoever complies with it will find life in it. 
it's a little more clear than it says whoever keeps the law is going to live by it. That almost sounds like bondage, and that's the way the you know, translators intended it to sound of the King James, unfortunately, because they didn't understand walking in Torah. But the true translation is that whoever complies with it will find life in it, because there is life in the Torah. Finally, again, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalms 122.6 gives us this instruction. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that they shall prosper that love you. So we pray as priests of Yahweh. He has made us a kingdom of priests. We are to pray His will in situations as we are His representatives here in the earth. We pray, just like Yeshua said, pray this way, your will be done, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we don't just pray that, we actually practice that. Because as we pray, I mean, we seek his face and his instruction. He's given us some general commands on what we're supposed to do in the Great Commission and other things. And so we walk out these things that we're praying as we're praying for him as well. We don't just say a bunch of words. We actually put them to practice and make sure that his will is done in this earth through prayer, through going, and through doing. So in the Old Covenant, our high priest could only enter the holiest of holies once a year to atone for himself and for the people of Israel. Now we're now priests of a better covenant. Now our high priest lives in the Holy of Holies, continually making intercession for us. He doesn't just enter in once a year now. He dwells there and we're seated with him in heavenly places. So we are there as well. So constantly his blood is cleansing us of all sins. If we screw up and we, we blow it, then he says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We are completely restored into complete righteousness. We can be righteous and holy as he is holy. And if our flesh gets in the way and we blow it, we just immediately confess it, get it out of the way, and we get there again. Now we're going to look at our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 8.1 says, This is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the Torah from Levi who serve the copy and shadow of the things, or of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. And one of them is, he didn't just, we don't have to wait for Yom Kippur now. We can immediately go into that throne room, and he's already there, as our advocate interceding for us. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says Yahweh. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my Torah, my laws, in their minds. Write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none of them his brother, saying, Know Yahweh. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So the old covenant is becoming obsolete and growing old because it's not, uh, and, but we're not really to that point yet. The physical pictures of the spiritual realities that Moses saw in the heavenly throne room at Mount Sinai are still essential for us as long as we have flesh and blood. We can't see into the Holy of Holies ourselves, even though we're seated with Yeshua in heavenly places and we can have access, we still can't physically see that our brains leak. We need to be reminded. So he gave us these physical pictures. And it's interesting, he says, a new covenant has made the first obsolete. So what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Well, it's not there yet. These are the correct tenses. It's becoming obsolete. And it's growing old. Just like this earth is. Groaning. Waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. 
And Yeshua ties this, the Torah to the heavens and the earth, so we know that this older covenant is tied to this physical realm. It's the physical pictures of the spiritual realities that we don't yet have in full manifestation. I mean, we, we do have the down payment, the Holy Spirit, and we are fused together with Him, but we don't have our glorified bodies yet, and we don't have that manifestation of completely knowing as we're completely known. We know all things, it says that, it's in our spirits, but we don't have it all in our souls yet. So we're still in that process of renewing our minds and doing the things that we need to do. So the Old Covenant is the physical pictures that this physical realm needs to understand the spiritual realities that we can't physically see, as I said. This Old Covenant is tied to this physical realm. And Yeshua tells us the timing of it. Matter of fact, Matthew 5, 17, Don't think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth passes away, that is why it's growing old, because heaven and earth is waxing old. Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the Torah till it's all fulfilled. Whosoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we know from Deuteronomy chapter 6 that if you keep the words written in this, it'll be righteousness for you. So the scribes and Pharisees had some righteousness, but it wasn't enough to enter in. They went about to establish their own righteousness. And you can't bypass Mashiach in doing so. I mean, they were blessed and they were rewarded for the Torah that they kept because there's natural laws that will come about as you walk in the Torah. You'll be blessed. But it's not enough to get you there, just like the Christian standing in front of him in, Rome, in Matthew 7. It says, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out devils in your name and, and did mighty works in your name. But he had to say, depart from me, I never knew you because you're lawless. you got to have both sides of the equation. You can't just keep the Torah and you can't just walk after the Spirit. You've actually got to do both. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Going on in verse 21, Yeshua then starts explaining these covenants. He says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. And that's still true today, obviously. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Racha, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool! Because those your words can cut. You can destroy somebody with words. He shall be in danger of hell fire because that's killing somebody with your words. He wants us to be careful of our words because they're powerful. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way with him lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hands you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that was said of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, and obviously that rule still applies, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So he's not making things easier, is he? Actually, because he's given us the Holy Spirit, he's raising the standard. The bar has been raised. Now we have to walk in the spirit of the Torah, not just the letter. It's not saying that we don't follow the letter, but the letter itself will not get us eternal life. The letter kills. If you're trying to earn your salvation by just the letter, you're going to die and go to hell. But the spirit of the law will bring life. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. If you can't get over your lust, that's the way to deal with it. Not literally, but cut it off, period. Get rid of your phone, get rid of your computer, whatever it is that you're having a problem with, cut it off. For it's more profitable for you than one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Whatever's causing the problem, cut it off. Get rid of it. Don't mess with it, because it will take you to hell if you're not careful. So Yeshua here explains that the commandments are all valid as long as the physical realm remains. The scriptures are eternal. Yeshua explains that the new covenant, the standards, have actually been raised with the giving of the Holy Spirit, like I said. To whom much is given, much is required. 
It's a better covenant, but it comes with more responsibility. We are priests with Yeshua as our high priest, and we're to be like Yeshua. So we need to learn what he's doing as our high priest so we can imitate him. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Yeshua, who was made a little lower than the angels. And that's talking about in physical prowess. Obviously, he's God in the flesh, so he's not lower than the angels spiritually. But, and he could command the angels. He says, Don't you know I could command a legion of angels to do this if we needed? For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom all our things are... And, uh, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in other words, he is the creator, and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, what sufferings did he go through to make us perfect? Well, he was never sick a day in his life, so it's not sickness and disease. He was persecuted by religious people. That's going to be the primary thing that's going to affect us. We have been healed by the stripes of Yeshua. We don't have to put up with sickness and disease and physical maladies as far as those sufferings. Satan might try to put it on us, but it's not from Yahweh. But we can expect, just like Paul's thorn in the flesh, it was not a sickness or a disease. It was an angel, angelos in the Greek, of Satan sent to buffet him to cause problems, to stir things up. And that's the persecutions that we're going to be suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I the, and the children of whom God has given me. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil." and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We don't have to be afraid of death anymore. For indeed, he does not give aid to the angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he has had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make pro uh, propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted... He is able to aid those who are tempted. So this is the suffering, the temptations. Satan tempted him in the wilderness, and he defeated him by speaking the word. So we're going to go through temptations, through trials and things like this. But things that are designed to kill, steal, and destroy, we know are from the enemy. Yeshua said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So he is merciful, and he came in the form of flesh so that he would know what we're going through. So he would experience it, so that he would be that merciful high priest. So we need to do the same thing in identifying with people, not that we have to go through drug addiction or prostitution or anything like that, but, but we know that we're flesh. We've got hang-ups. We've got problems. We don't judge people. We are compassionate with them, knowing that they've got flesh and they've been tempted and Satan's seeking to destroy them too. We're not to judge people that way. We're to be compassionate, to love them, and love them into the kingdom because love never fails. In Hebrews 3, 1, Therefore, holy brethren... Partakers in the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Messiah Yeshua. So we have to confess with our mouth for him to become our high priest and apostle. Who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And here it's saying Yeshua, who is the creator of all things, is God, basically. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Messiah as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So it's conditional. We have to abide in him. We have to keep our confidence and rejoicing in the hope firm to the end. We have to abide in him. It's always conditional. It's not an automatic thing. Now, we're born again by the Spirit. We become a branch in the vine, but we still have to abide, and we still have to bear fruit. So it's a process. We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. As he is compassionate and understanding with us, as I said, we are to be with one another and with those that he died for that are not yet born again. We need to realize that Satan is trying to destroy us all. We all have a common enemy. We're all in this together. 
and we have to have each other's backs. Going on in Hebrews 3, 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. Because we're going to come through some more trials that are going to be kind of like that. So He's saying, well, learn from the mistakes. Where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Messiah, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom he was, uh, was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom he, uh, did he swear that he would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So if we want to enter his rest, we need to be obedient. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So we have to stay and abide by faith, knowing that he's faithful. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel is preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith and those who heard it. Now, why not? He's given to each man the measure of faith. They didn't decide to use their faith in that. They decided to keep living for their flesh. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So the Sabbath plays a major part into entering his rest. And this is something the old faith healers didn't understand. Most of them died young because they didn't enter into his rest. They wore their bodies out. They didn't use the wisdom that he gave us in the Torah. They didn't use the Sabbath as he had given it to us. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not beca enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He's still talking about Shabbat. The Sabbath is precious for him. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Now, it's the Sabbath, resting in the Sabbath, as we rest in Yeshua. It's the spirit and truth. It's that whole thing. You, you can practice one and not have the other, or practice the other and not have the one. He wants us to do both. And that's how we're going to be preserved. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. That's saying it's talking about the Sabbath. That's when God ceased, because right now he's working. He is maybe not on Yom Kippur, but I mean, he's healing, he's doing all these other things, and, and he didn't cease from his labors permanently, and we don't cease from ours either. We just cease on the Shabbat and on his Moedim, the days he told us not to work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God, the Torah, from Torah to Revelation, is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This is how the devil was defeated in the wilderness with the Torah. The book of Deuteronomy is what Yeshua quoted. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This is how we discern the spirits of people and other things. It all goes back to the Torah. Are they walking in Torah? Do they love Torah? Do they hate Torah? Do they? I mean, it goes back to that and Messiah. The Torah made flesh. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we have the boldness now because we walk in spirit and in truth. We know that we are in him because we keep his commandments. We've looked at that before, but then we also know by the spiritual witness as well. Spirit and truth. So Yahweh wants all of his children to enter into his Shabbat rest to observe his Shabbat just like Yeshua did. He also reveals that how we handle the Word of God and how we apply the Word of God will reveal what's in our hearts. As we abide in Yeshua through obedience, this gives us the confidence to boldly enter the heavenly holy of holies as we are one with our high priest. We are our daddy's children as we're abiding in Yeshua. So in the old covenant, the, the priest could only enter the holy of holies, or couldn't enter the holy of holies, but only the high priest. The regular priests couldn't go there at all. In the new covenant, we're seated with Messiah in the heavenly places. So we get to go in there boldly as long as we're abiding in him. In Yeshua, we can have constant access to the Holy of Holies. Going on in Hebrews 5, 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men to, in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can, uh, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Ignorant and going astray. Notice that he's not compassionate on those that are sinning willfully. It's the ignorant and the ones that are going astray. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aharon was. So also Messiah did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications and vehement cries and tears of him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So the suffering, the persecution, is going to teach us some things. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. There is eternal security as we obey him. Called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So obedience is how he learned. He learned obedience through the suffering, and that's how we're going to be obedient as well. The suffering's part of it. It's not always pleasant, but we can learn from it. So we're to have compassion on one another as Yeshua had compassion on us. We're all created in the image and the likeness of God. We're all to learn obedience through the things we suffer just like Yeshua. And we can't become discouraged. We have eternal salvation through our obedience to Him. We have to keep in mind there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Even though we're going through things that might not be fun... The answer lies ahead, and as we're faithful, he will bring us through. Hebrews 6.13, For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and in multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fl uh, fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Yeshua, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Shalom, or king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. This is describing Yeshua, calling him Mel Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, king of shalom. But when he appeared to Abraham, that's who Abraham cut covenant with, was Yeshua himself. Not having father or mother, 
or beginning of end or uh, days or end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. If it, Melchizedek was just a, a regular guy, he would not be a priest continually. That is only speaking about Yeshua. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils, and indeed those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the Torah, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Yeshua, who was known as Melchizedek at the time, is the one receiving our tithes. Even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So Melchizedek is Yeshua, our eternal high priest, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, and is our high priest forever. Hebrews 9.1 Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared. The first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer. Now, the golden censer was only behind that veil once a year, today, Yom Kippur. So this is not saying that the altar of incense is back there. This is, just, this is describing the Yom Kippur service. And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things have been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself, and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So he offered a bull for himself, and then the, the blood of the goats. When it talks about the blood of bulls and goats, it's talking about the offering for the priest and for the people. Um, verse, okay, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So, as we're going to see, when the veil was rent in the temple... It wasn't Yahweh's presence departing. It was him opening the veil of Yeshua's flesh so that we could have access to the holiest of all. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerning only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. So what is the time of Reformation? Well... It started when Yeshua gave his life on the cross and that veil rent and now we have access, but it is not going to be completely reformed until we get our glorified bodies and everything else. Till heaven and earth passes away, not one jot or one tittle will pass away. But Messiah came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of, he of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, and it's still the case, and our st flesh still needs to be purified as long as we have physical flesh, it's not doing away with it, how much more shall the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serving the living God? Now, he's not saying the animal sacrifices and everything else are dead works. They are if you're not born again, if that's what you're relying on for your salvation or your righteousness. But it's still an integral part of loving our Father, if we understand what it was all about to start with. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. 
For when Moses had spoken every precept to all of the people according to the Torah, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book uh, and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. So that's the part of the covenant that was considered the old covenants. When we came out, we were at Mount Sinai, and it's before he went up and got the ten tablets even. This was the book of the covenant where there was about 110 commands written on it. And he read it to the people, and, and we said, we, we accept it, we'll do it. Then he went on and got the rest of the Torah. So this is just the first part he's talking about. This was the blood of the covenant, the old covenant, that he's talking about. Not the instructions of our Father. There's none of it that actually was done away with. We broke the first part, and that's what he's talking about. And that's why he had to send Yeshua to come and establish the rest. We lost the priesthood of the firstborn as a result of it. The Levites took over that job. And so there were some changes until the time of redemption. Verse 21, Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law of the Torah, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. And that's why the, the honest Orthodox Jews before Yom Kippur, they'll take a chicken, cut its head off, and swing it around and let the blood fly, because they know there's no, no atonement without blood. Not all of Judaism does it, but there are certain ultra-Orthodox that do that because they understand this principle. They're the honest ones. It won't do them any good because you can only do it with the blood of Yeshua now, but at least they understand the concept. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Messiah has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the most holy place every year without blood, with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Messiah was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. So Yom Kippur is all about Yeshua as our eternal high priest. And his one sacrifice that all of the other sacrifices points us to. They're all illustrations. They're all pictures of that eternal blood of Yeshua, sacrificed from the foundation of the earth. Hebrews 10.1, For the law, the Torah, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those that approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remainder, a reminder of sin every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It was never designed to. It was pictures pointing us to his blood, the blood of the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. It's always been about his blood. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. The volume of the book, that's the Torah. He said, If you don't believe Torah, you don't believe me, because Moses wrote of me. Previously saying, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them. Now why did he desire them? Because he had desired obedience, not sacrifice. If you obeyed, you wouldn't have to offer a sacrifice. That's what he wanted. It's not that he didn't want us to have a way back. He didn't want anybody to have to die. But because we blew it, there had to be death. There had to be bloodshed to bring us back into that relationship with him. <clears throat> Which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. So there again, what did he take away? The effects of being able to see what his blood actually did. He, he established the second as showing us now that he is the true high priest that all these things pointed towards. And Hebrews was written right before the destruction of the temple. God knew that we were going to need instructions on how to worship without the temple because the temple is the center core of our worship. I mean, the early believers met there daily. 
Yeshua said, this is my father's house. So what do we, how do we worship Yahweh without the center core of his worship system? That's why Hebrews was written. So he's taken away this verse that he can establish a second so we can again focus on the true. And that's what the first actually should have pointed us towards, but obviously the Jews didn't get that because they didn't accept Yeshua when he came. So he had to take that away so that they now have no excuse. They have to look at the second if they're going to come to the Father. It's got to be through the Son, the priesthood of Melchizedek. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua, Messiah, once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Now, who's going to make his enemies his footstool? He's sitting up there. God the Father's up there. He's not coming down to do it. We are his hands and his feet. It is our job to make his enemies his footstool. That's what's going to usher in the return of the Messiah. we got to get busy, guys. <clears throat> For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my Torah in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. The writings of the new covenant is his Torah. The instructions did not change. Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Now, that really should say there's no longer a required offering for sin, because we know that there were still offerings for sin still going on until the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. Matter of fact, Paul, in his vow of the Nazarite that he took in Acts 18 and 18 when he's in Sancria, he shaved his head because he had a vow. You go back to number 6 and look, one of those sacrifices is a sin sacrifice. Paul was going to do that. So, but he understood that it wouldn't have the effect of atoning for sin. He understood the deeper meaning of what it was pointing towards. Verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, that's what the tearing of the veil represented, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Now we can go through the veil ourselves. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. See, if we all stayed home, we wouldn't be here and sharing our anointing and receiving, and we wouldn't be able to provoke each other. He wants us to have these sacred assemblies. This is so we can help each other grow. So iron can sharpen iron, so we can provoke each other to love and good works. For if we sin willfully, and in context, it's talking about if we don't keep his moedim the way he wants us to, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. And then again, this is the proper tense. This is the New King James Version. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies, present tense, without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? How do you do all that? Well, if you're a Jew, you can say Yeshua is not the Messiah, but if you're a Christian, you can say the Torah is garbage, and we're not doing that. He is the living Torah. So you've got to be careful because you're trampling him under feet if you trample his Torah underfoot because Spirit and truth, they are one. For we know him who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Now, we don't judge each other in, while they're doing this. We pray for one another. We can't condemn people because we don't know the end result. They might repent like the thief on the cross right at the last. So we can't condemn them. We can give them the truth, but we've got to know that Yahweh is the one that's going to deal with them. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, Yahweh will judge his people. We're not to judge one another, Yahweh will. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We need to warn people that you are going to be judged. I'm not judging you, but there will be a judgment day, and it's a fearful thing to fall into his hands. So you need to repent. He's not willing that any should perish. 
We are Yahweh's children, joint heirs with Yeshua, if we're willing to suffer with him, that we might be glorified together, is what it said. Though Yahweh is our loving Father, we must retain our fear of being out of his will. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of our God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. We're going to be judged by our works. He wants our works to be good works. He wants us to walk in obedience to Torah, to help others, to love others, to pray for others, all the things he said. We have to do it. We can't just say this little magical incantation and think the job's done and we've got it. It doesn't work that way. We have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For our entire life, we're here. Our life here is to determine what our eternity is going to be. We're going to be rewarded for what we do here, for our works, whether good or bad, like Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. So we're told not to judge one another, yet we must be aware that we will be judged by our Creator, and we need to warn one another that judgment's coming. He wants us to succeed. He's told us how to in His instructions, but it's up to us to follow Him. We've got to tell people these are His instructions. The Torah, the law, that is a legalistic term that was not in the Hebrew. The, the main part of it is instruction. These are the loving instructions of our Father, how He wants us to act to each other and how He wants us to love Him. May we all remain faithful to His instructions, and may we all endure until the end. Next year in Jerusalem, let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for this time of Yom Kippur that you have brought us to, that we can, we can contemplate all that Yeshua has done for us. We can rejoice in that sacrifice. We can come before you humbly, praying for one another, loving one another, even as Yeshua laid his life down for us and loved us. I just thank you, Father, for the honor and the privilege of being your people, your children, the sheep of your pasture. You are so good. You are so faithful. Help us all to retain that godly fear. We know that you're a loving Father, but we also know there's a day of judgment coming and that the enemy is seeking to devour us, but we need to pray for one another so that it doesn't happen. Thank you, Father, for the mighty, awesome things that you're doing. You're so good. I thank you that you've made us a kingdom of priests. I thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh, Vayishmarecha. Ya'er Yahweh, Penavelecha, Vihunecha. Yesa Yahweh Penavelecha Vayasim Lecha Shalom May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen.